Hey all, welcome to Parker's Reef. On today's episode, we're gonna do a deep dive, in fact, a two year review into this here, my absolutely gorgeous dream reef tank. All right, guys, thank you for joining me on another episode of Parker's Reef. And yes, the time is here, in fact, I'm probably three to four weeks overdue for the two year review of my dream reef tank. It's been a pretty hectic last couple of months, but um, the main thing was I wanted to give this video the time and dedication it deserves because believe it or not, the uh, playlist on my YouTube channel for the dream reef tank, the uh, main tank upgrade, I believe it's called, has actually accumulated nearly 1 million views across its 60, roughly 60 videos, which is absolutely mind blowing for someone like myself who is just just another reef a hobbyist at home who happens to stand in front of his camera with a microphone and just share my journey with all you guys at home. So nearing a million views on this uh, playlist alone is absolutely mind blowing. So first and foremost, a huge shout out to everyone who has followed along with the journey, especially those who have subscribed to the channel. And then even more, especially to those out there who have joined the channel as paid members, it really does make videos like this possible. So thank you so much guys who have joined and watched along the journey because, um, I must admit it's truly a humbling experience. Now, to give you a little bit of an overview of what we're gonna do in this video, it will be relatively long, so I will ensure that I put chapter markers in there so you can skip to the parts you wanna watch most if you don't wanna see me talk about this tank for the full time frame, which um, I must admit at this point in filming, I don't actually know how long it'll be, but you'll be able to see it in the video length down below. But what I thought I might do is actually start at the top of the tank, work my way down, we'll go over any changes, uh, anything that I think is absolutely revolutionary to me and my reef aquarium journey, anything that I probably wouldn't do again, some things that I think were probably not worth the money or a change of process or something like that. And then um, maybe we'll just go over some of my favorite things in the tank at the end, just to sort of wrap it all up. I have looked over the comments over the last couple of months to see what things you guys want covered. And um, funnily enough, probably um, the thing that I've had the most questions about is up above the tank there, you can see it oscillating back and forth. It's just your uh, humble house fan that I've added to the tank. And uh, I guess because it's up there front and center, moving right in front of your eyesight, it has had Probably a few dozen people say, hey, what's the fan? Where do I get it? What does it do on your tank? So maybe that's where we'll start the journey up above the tank. All right, so as promised, starting at the top of my tank, probably the new addition and probably the only thing that is new up there is in fact the Breville fan up there. And I gotta tell you guys, it is absolutely nothing special. It is a fairly expensive fan, but that's only because we have one of these in the house already, a slightly larger version, which is a, a freestanding fan. And um, I quite liked how quiet it was. It moves quite a bit of air. It oscillates left, right, up, down. And in fact, I think Breville give it the 360 degree air movement, which just means left, right, up, down doesn't actually do full 360 degrees, but we're not gonna get into uh, any patents right here. And all I did was I mounted it up to my uh, T-bar or aluminum extrusion uh, light frame up there, which thankfully, because it is basically a big uh, Meccano set, made that super easy to do. I did have to take the base off the fan, drill a couple of holes in there so I could run either bolts or zip ties. In my instance, I went zip ties because I don't know, I'm a zip tie kind of guy with a motorsport background. And um, I built up a little bit of uh, framing on there just so I could mount it to the light frame. Main reason being, if I take you over here, is that when I raise or lower my lights by uh, activating my uh, sit stand light frame, you can see that the fan actually moves with the lights, which is exactly what I wanted it to do. The last thing I wanted to have was to have my uh, fan sitting on the tank and then if I move the lights up or down too far that it get knocked by it and fall in the tank or fall off the tank or crush it, anything like that. And the primary purpose of that fan is actually to keep a little bit of air movement around the light fixtures. Not that I've had any problems at all, but when I do close up the hood like this, using the uh, controls or the buttons over there, when it's all closed up like that and we have people over or uh, we're just wanting to watch a movie and not have lights spill into the room, the amount of heat that builds up in there is pretty, uh, pretty stunning. So I do actually have a little exhaust fan up in the ceiling there, which does just pull air through there. And it's actually um, overrated for the size of the space. But I did just want to add a little bit of extra air movement there just to make sure that the air fixtures, more so the Kessels than anything else, the Phillips seem to be incredibly, um, 
overrated to their uh, requirements, but the Kessels wanted to make sure we're getting plenty of air movement. And of course, it doesn't hurt just to have a little bit of air movement above the tank when in Australia, like we are now, getting into our warmer months. So all I did was mount that up. I'll give you some footage on screen now so you can see how I went about doing that. It does actually look a little agricultural when you get up close, but from a distance, it looks absolutely Mickey Mouse. And that's exactly what I wanted. It looks as if it was built for aquarium use. And I think that's why I've had so many questions about it. All right, the next thing to talk about this tank and one of the things that I would absolutely not change to the world. In fact, I don't think I would build a new tank without something like this or exactly this setup. And that is the motorized light frame itself. For those of you who remember, I built it out of a sit stand desk with dual motors and then just added some aluminum extrusion to it so I could mount my lights. Being able to come over here, press this button to raise or lower the lights to preset locations is absolutely ridiculous. And it does make mounting lights, which you may or may not realize is a uh, favorite pastime of mine. Whenever a new light comes out, I like to try it and mount it up to this tank. So being able to mount things to that aluminum extrusion is so, so cool. The lock line mounts that I've used on these Kessels, which allow me to mount Kessels, angle them wherever I want, has been super, super cool. It's one thing again that I would not change. In fact, I don't know why Kessel don't just get into partnership with Lockline and uh, release these mounts as a standard thing because I think it's absolutely awesome. You can extend them, you can shorten them, you can add right angle pieces, you could mount wires, so you could have two Kessels and have them angled out. Whatever you want to do, that Lockline mount, particularly on the aluminium extrusion, is next level and you combine that with the motorized sit stand desk and it just makes working on this tank incredibly easy. The other thing I should mention there is the lights that I would not change for the life of me if I was to redo this tank and the lights I probably would change if I was to do this tank again. First and foremost, the Philips Coral Cares on this tank have been absolutely revolutionary. I did not think I would ever run a tank this sort of size again without metal halide. That was until I met the Philips Coral Care Gen 2 lights and I have to say they have acted exactly like metal halides, which was exactly what I wanted, both in their size, their spread, their color. Probably not so much their weight. The um, metal halides I've ran before are super, super light because they're just very thin reflective film. The Philips Coral Cares are solid, solid chunks of metal because there is no fans on them whatsoever. They just uh, uh, passively dissipate the heat through their big metal uh, heatsink on them, which is fantastic. There's nothing to service, nothing to go wrong. It makes them IP67 rated, but does mean that they do put out a little bit of passive heat, hence why I added the fan there, just to keep some air circulation there. But those lights have been absolutely incredible. If I was to be remotely critical on them at all, is if you want to get the maximum power out of them, which you know I do, I'm all about power, you'd need to run them at a fairly white coloration. And to get that extra little bit of pop of blue, I did add some more lights. Now, I am running a bunch of castles above this tank, way more than anyone would really need, but as touched on before, I do love PAR. So I do have two of the A500X castles and five of the A360X castles. And I have to say, I would absolutely add them again. They are an expensive purchase, particularly here in Australia. The uh, conversion rate makes castles pretty expensive for the amount of oomph they give out, but I have to say, I absolutely love the color and shimmer. It is something I would absolutely do again in this tank is to add those castles for that color and shimmer. Plus what I've done with the lock line mounts and these uh, narrow reflectors has given me the ability to really spotlight and add some high part or a particular spot, particular couple of spots of my tank. Things like uh, my showpiece corals, like Walt Disney Aquapora and things like that. I've really wanted to spotlight and get extra power in there. And those little reflectors do that fantastically. Now onto the flip side of that, what would I do differently with a light frame? Well, firstly, I don't think I would run the Orfec light bars, the OR3s. I know some people out there absolutely swear by Orfec. I have to say I've been probably less than impressed. I did do the optic removal on them, which made them much wider spread, which of course has impacted the par quite a lot. I wasn't worried about the par, I just wanted a nice uniform blue spill of light because my Kessels are pretty much all running reflectors. So when I use those to give the blue coloration to the tank to supplement the Philips Coral Cares, they're pretty narrow bands of that, which is fair enough. So I have added the Orfec OR3 bars and I've got four of them over this tank running front to back with the optics removed. And I just have to say, I don't think they really produce a lot. They give a little bit of color, almost no par. They produce an awful amount of heat. And um, I don't know, I just don't think they're worth the money. There is a good range of light bars out there in the market now that I would absolutely investigate further if I was to start this tank again. But um, it's a minor gripe. They are doing the job. They add a little bit of color. They add a little bit of fill. 
It's one of those things, I don't have to buy them every month. It's not a license or anything like that. I've bought the, uh, the Orfex, they're on the tank, they do the job, but if I was to build it again, I wouldn't add those, I'd add something else. All right, edging slightly lower down from the lights, and that is the jump guard that I've got on this tank. It's something that I have absolutely appreciated having on this tank. It's been incredible when looking at fish selection and not having to worry at all about fish that are jumping because it has complete coverage. The guys did an absolutely ridiculous job of building that. I will make sure the link to the uh, video of that uh, jump guard is on there. Depending where you are in the world, there are a lot of people out there now making these custom jump guards for your tanks. And I couldn't recommend them enough. I do have some jump guards on other tanks and I gotta say the ones that come from factories are a little bit flimsy and really difficult to work with. And downright ugly to be honest. Not that it really matters on this tank because it is above your eye line, but being able to have something neat and tidy, a secure fit, and then most importantly, in my opinion, being able to easily remove it without dipping it into the tank and getting salt water on it and getting salt creep everywhere and then having to carry this wet jump guard through your tank, dripping water everywhere, or carry it through your house, I should say, dripping water everywhere. These are just really, really nice. And NVS Aquariums did a brilliant job building this. They've done a few bits of acry acrylic work for me over um, a few of my tanks. And um, well, this isn't acrylic, it's actually polycarbonate, but it is absolutely beautiful. And um, it's held up to the test of time. It's two years old now, still looks as nice as the day I got it and is still doing the job perfectly. All right, next up is probably the most obvious thing in the build, and that is the glass box itself. My custom water box aquarium, which I have to say has been absolutely incredible. Not only was this tank considerably cheaper than I thought it would be, it arrived considerably better quality than I could ever have expected. The glass is impeccable. The silicon work in the corners and the top is just absolutely beautiful. Even two years later with me ramming magnet cleaners into it, the Euro bracing on top is absolutely sensational. And all of the dimensions they cut, things like over in my, um, for my shadow uh, weir there, the overflow box where they cut the holes for me, they laser cut them out or water like, etched them out, whatever they did, absolutely turned out perfectly, made getting this tank set up on plumb so, so easy. Just bolted that uh, weir on, put the, uh, the lock nuts on the back and ran the piping to it, job done. And the glass work, like I said, is just held up an absolute treat. It does not scratch easily. It does not add any sort of tint to the uh, color of the corals at all. Uh, the silicon is still beautiful. And of course it does have my own little uh, little uh, name up there on the top there, Parker's Reef framed in water box. And I have to say, whenever people ask me, I'm super, super proud to say that this is a custom water box. I know there is no shortage of options out there for tanks and I wouldn't always recommend, in fact, very rarely would I recommend a custom build for most people out there building a tank. But um, Waterbox did make a good job of this. And if you were gonna go a custom tank, I, I would struggle to recommend against them. All right, onto the most important thing of the update, and that's everything inside the glass block. There's fish, there's coral, there's pumps, there's all sorts happening in there, and a few things that I wanna really spend a little bit of time on. So um, get yourself comfortable, get yourself a drink. This section of the video is probably gonna be a little bit long. I guess we should probably start off with, um, I guess the sad thing, a few episodes ago, I did talk about uh, adding a dream fish to my tank in the Feminist Rass, and um, I have to unfortunately say it did not make it, and um, I, I mean, it still weighs heavy on me. I don't know what actually went wrong with the fish. Um, I know a lot of you are gonna jump on there and say you didn't quarantine it and that's what happened. Yeah, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. I did lose a couple of other fish at the same time, which just really rubbed a bit of salt in the wounds. And um, it was just a difficult time. That was when I found out I was gonna be made redundant. I just lost a pretty expensive fish and I had no explanation as to why. Then a couple of my other fish in my Ballast Angels, my uh, Sunburst Anthea, and uh, two of the three Pyramid Angels, uh, Pyramid Butterflies, sorry, that I added to this tank all passed in the same sort of fortnight, which was um, super, super frustrating. Now, I, I don't know what happened. I removed each and every one of the fish when they passed and gave them a very thorough inspection. There was absolutely no signs of bullying. They were all eating. Everything looked pretty good, but um, they just didn't make it. And unfortunately, I don't want to uh, smooth over the fact that um, I've lost living things in my care because I don't want to normalize that and make it okay. But on the same hand, it's not a perfect hobby. Things do happen. 
You can't beat yourself up over it forever. I have put some uh, measures in place if these sort of things continue in the future. We have uh, reached out and are working with an aquarium vet that will be able to um, do an autopsy if I have any more unexplained deaths on the fish, which will give me a little bit more of an insight. I have done all sorts of uh, ICPs, Triton, ICP, Triton, Endoc, absolutely nothing out of the ordinary there. And like I touched on, there was no aggression. Um, they were all eating, no evidence of any sort of parasites, but um, it's one of those things you just scratch your head. So I guess, I don't know whether I will add another feminist rasp, probably not at least until I land a job because um, they are expensive fish here in Australia, particularly hand caught ones in Australia. So I'm just gonna sort of pump the brakes there a little bit, but I can say I did test the waters with I don't want to say cheaper fish because they're all life and um, the monetary value that we put on them is kind of irrelevant. But I did take a little bit of a leaf out of uh, Reef Dork's page uh, when I saw on his channel that he had three different types of hawks living in his tank. I'd always been under the impression that it was not possible to mix hawks, um, particularly at different times. And uh, for those who have watched this channel for a while now know I do have a lovely mated pair of flame hawks in this tank, which um, to be fair, one of my favorite fish in the tank. They've got really cool personalities, beautiful coloration, and um, really give a strange bit of movement to the tank without the swim bladder. They're always swimming and then perching, trying to see if I can spot them anywhere now. Not obvious, but they do hide about and the pair of them do follow each other around a fair bit, which is super, super cute. So I'd already got to, used to the fact that I was not gonna be able to add shrimp to this tank because it is one of their favorite diets. But I was a little upset that I was not able to add a long nose hawk because it is a fish that I have wanted for a long time. I don't know why they don't cost thousands of dollars with that incredible white and red lace sort of uh, pattern on them. They're cool personalities, really uh, just interesting fish. Obviously they do eat shrimp, but I've already got over the fact that I'm not gonna have shrimp in this tank. And then when I saw Reef Dog say that um, he had them in his tank and I reached out and asked how long they've been in there, what sort of success rate. He assured me all would be fine, which I know there is no guarantees in this hobby, but I did add a long nose hawk in and it's been a number of weeks now and he's fitted in absolutely fine. Zero bullying whatsoever. The hawks exist in harmony completely together, which again, there's no guarantees. I'm not recommending you all go out and add 20 different types of hawks to your tank, but I can say that my long nose hawk has not copped any grief whatsoever, so far at least, from my flame hawks and he's been an absolutely awesome addition. So we have named him Dipper, following on with the uh, sort of naming protocol that I've done with my other Hawks. The reason why I've gone that is in, in Australia, our football uh, league here, AFL, we have a team called Hawthorne and they are the Hawks. So when I named my Flame Hawks, I had Buddy because uh, Buddy used to be a famous Hawthorne player that then went to Sydney, which uh, are a red team. So he's a red Hawk. I went with Buddy Franklin there. And then of course we had his uh, partner Jacinta added into the system. So it's Buddy and Jacinta. But then for the long nose hawk, I tried to think of something that was going to work there. And um, we ended up with Dipper. In fact, can I see Dipper now? No, nah, he's hiding, of course. The camera's out. They've all gone shy. I've gone for Dipper because he is a long nose hawk. And um, when I tried to think of Hawthorne players throughout history that had big noses, no one better came to mind than the old mate Dipper himself. So we've got Dipper in the tank now. And I got to say, he's been a really cool addition. And just awesome peace of mind that there's not something lurking in my tank that's just wiping out new additions because I gotta tell you that uh, that couple of weeks there where I lost the feminist ras was um, it was pretty dark so adding a new fish having it succeed is um, a huge weight off my shoulders and hopefully maybe down the line we can have a look at adding some new fish to this tank as well. Now, before I move on to the corals in the system, I did just want to touch on some of the fish that are not new, but uh, have still been in my system doing a great job. You can see my fox face down here, Colin's been an awesome guy. He's been with me for over a decade now, and um, he's just such a cool fish. He did get really, really skinny when I shut down my previous display tank, and he went into a holding system for a probably the good part of a year while uh, we were planning and scheming and working out this build and doing the uh, floor renovations and uh, kitchen renovations and painting this room and things like that. It's taken some time to fatten him up, but he's getting, he's getting there now. I mean, he still probably doesn't hold a light to, um, to uh, Lily here, my, uh, my uh, blonde Naso and Luca, the Atlantic blue Tang, but you can see he's got a decent belly on him now. So that's really cool. And I think 
As far as I know, I think he's doing a good job keeping the bubble algae at bay in my tank. I do have some about and um, I will do a program with it down the line. But to be honest, the bubble algae I've noticed in the tank now for probably, I don't know, maybe 14 to 16 months and um, I haven't done anything about it and um, it hasn't gotten out of hand. So I'm not going to overreact to it. I don't want to try and treat it and uh, wipe out half of my coral to fix a problem that maybe isn't that big of a problem. Not that I'm suggesting no one has to do anything ever about bubble algae, but so far in this system, it's been mostly kept at bay. There's a couple of little patches here, but I think, not that I've ever seen him actively eat it, but I'm gonna give Colin the nod because the only places I see bubble algae are places where he probably can't get to. So I don't know if that's enough evidence, but that's what I'm going with. So he's been an awesome, awesome guy in this tank. All of the existing tangs in this system. So I've got the Atlantic Blue who's gone strangely pale at the moment. He likes to do that sometimes when he's nervous. My uh, Purple Tang Prince. Um, you will see my uh, Mustard Tang up there, Colonel. He's still an absolute character. He's um, always riding the waves off the wave makers. Such a cool dude. Really, really love his patterns and colorations and he's just got a strange sort of personality. You can see him, he's not scratching you. He doesn't have any uh, white spot or anything like that. He's just a weird, weird fish. Closest thing I'll probably ever have to a, a blue tang. I'm not a massive blue tang fan, but I do love their personalities of how they're just, for lack of better words, a stupid fish. They do strange uh, things and have really strange personalities. And I gotta say my mustard, he's an Aussie mustard and um, he's been super, super cool. Uh, the other fish I've got in here, I did start my journey uh, with bicolor anthias and I have to say they dwindled down. I do still have one left. I'll see if I can find uh, the one. No, he's gonna hide at the moment. Oh, there he is over in the uh, back corner there. I got one bicolor anthia left. So I went back to what I know and I went for the uh, liotail anthias and I gotta say it's been probably three or four months with those now and um, I haven't lost a single one, which is great. I've got a bunch of females and a single male in there and um, they're all doing really well. Uh, some other fish, you've got blue-green chromis in there, which are um, probably the most aggressive fish I have. Every night at sundown, they go absolutely berserk at each other. I haven't lost any numbers of them yet, but um, I am expecting over time, particularly with the amount of aggression they go at at each other every night, just chasing each other. And then my uh, mustard tang gets in there as well. If he sees a bit of activity, he's a bit like the, uh, the, the local feral dog. If he sees two other dogs fighting, He's in there, it's his fight as well. And um, he's not that much bigger than the Chromis, so um, that's kind of funny. Um, other than that, I guess I've got uh, my Australian Stripey still in there. My Aptasia problem has been completely taken care of. There are still a couple of here and there, little baby ones that he can't get to because he's a decent size now. And of course, oh, he's, gonna say he's going to the back to hide. Here he is, he's pretty big considering he went in about the size of a five cent coin. Um, I haven't seen him nipping at any corals, so. I'm gonna leave him in there personally because I think they're a cool, cool fish. I love the patterns on them. I was gonna say I love the colors, but it's not a lot of color to them. They're mostly a black and white fish with a bit of a yellow belly, um, but he's just got a really cool personality, a real nuggety fish, does not take crap off anyone. Absolute boss for a little fish. And um, he's doing probably the most important utilitarian job in there. I do have a file fish in there as well, so I don't wanna give the stripey full credit. I think the file fish did jump onto the Aptasia as well. I had both of them in the system for probably three, four, five weeks before they even looked at an Aptasia. It was only when I gave up and I injected the Aptasia with a bit of Aptasia X, the two of them just decided, as soon as they saw one melting, that it was the most uh, indelicate food on the planet and then went on an absolute mission to wipe them all out in um, probably about two or three days. And I've been expecting to have to take them back out for them to be uh, nipping at corals, but I haven't seen it yet. I do have the trap ready and uh, thankfully the stripey will be the easiest fish under the sun to catch because the dude is so food orientated that um, I could probably put a bit of food inside a net and dangle it on the tank and just uh, wipe him out there. But um, the file fish might be a little bit more tricky, but if neither of them turn onto corals, then I'm in no rush whatsoever to take either of them out. I probably should touch on my clowns. These were my first fish in the tank from Coastal Clownfish. Matt and Jade do an incredible job. I sent them a mission to find me the most incredible Picasso clowns that they could get their hands on. And um, Matt told me it'd be a little while, but he'd find something special for me. And I think it was like about 36 hours later, he was sending me videos of this pair of fish. And um, I have to say they've been super, super awesome. In fact, I can actually see my gem tang there now, just having a pick at some of those bubble algae. So maybe I was quick to give credit to the uh, fox face, the gem tang's doing their job there. So um, good job Onyx, you're doing great work too. And I feel bad probably brushing over him. I know gem tangs at the moment, particularly here in Australia, are going through um, 
A little bit of a uh, competition price war thing going on. There's a few very cheap gem tanks about. I've had uh, Onyx there for a number of um, number of uh, months now. Probably one of well, yeah probably nearly two years. I mean, the tank was cycled for a while before I added the tank gang in, but um, he's been a cool addition. and probably doesn't get the amount of credit he deserves because um, he's just a really nice, peaceful fish. He's probably near the bottom of the rank of uh, my tangs. It would go uh, the Atlantic Blue, um, then the uh, Blonde Lipstick. I will classify my rabbit in there. Colin would be next in line. Then we probably go down um, to uh, the, the Mustard and then as far down to the uh, the... Uh, gem tank from there so he's down the bottom of the pecking order and I think he knows it doesn't do any sort of uh, anything rash if he moves fast they'll uh, put him in line pretty quickly but um, he's been a super cool fish one fish I do have to mention though before I um, move on is of course my hybrid angel super super cool fish um, I'm gonna see if Prius is about I did just see him in here just keeping uh, the rock work nice and tidy. He is one fish that does nip at coral all day, every day, and he has pretty much from the day I got him, but um, it's not every day you get an opportunity to have a hybrid angel in your tank. And um, Prius is about as pretty as he gets. He's just down there, I can see him over in the corner. I'll be sure to put some footage on screen for you guys. For those who are interested, he is known as a tiger pig. He is a half lemon peel, half ebly angel. Not something you come across all that common. Definitely not something that is reef safe. So um, if you really, really love corals, particularly if you have things like acans, trachophilias, maybe not the fish for you. If you're mostly chunky LPS that you could live if it died and um, SPS, here he comes out now right on cue. Then what a cool fish to have. The colors markings on him are absolutely awesome. He's an angry little fish, but he has absolutely no firepower. I put him down to that uh, fat kid at school that um, gets angry at the drop of a hat, but just cannot catch anyone, can't do anything at all. He's got no fighting skills whatsoever. It's not unusual for him to chase after someone else, but um, he gets about maybe six inches into the chase and then is puffed and has to slow down. That being said, awesome, awesome fish. Really cool splash of color. And I have to say, without being elitist, I do really enjoy when people that have been in the reefing game for a long time come over and see my tank. And you know, I tend not to have anything too crazy in there. And you know, they'll be able to look at everything and name it. But then they look at my angel and go, what is that? I don't know what that fish is. So having something that uh, catches the eye of experienced reefers is pretty cool. Um, and I mean, he's been with me for probably nearly 10 years now. so. We've got a pretty tight bond. He's absolutely a member of the family. All right, next up on the list is corals in the tank. Now, I guess we'll probably start off with uh, maybe the downside there. I did get a little bit of a cyano outbreak in this tank. Oh, maybe outbreak's not the right word. There were a few patches of cyano that came into this tank and um, it happened at the time that everyone else here in Australia, in Melbourne at least, was getting cyano. And it is kind of when the weather changes a little bit and uh, you just go through some different conditions in the tank. I managed to uh, time that really well with um, a drop in alkalinity, which just fuels things further on. And I did also touch on before that I had a Triton Endoc test, which did also show that a couple of my uh, organic balances were out there which further helps cyano so it's probably no surprise that I did have a couple of cyano patches. Now interestingly I did have some on the back wall where uh, I don't get a lot of flow back there so I did rectify that by adding an additional MP60 on my back wall well on my side wall blowing down the back of the tank just to keep that flow moving there and I think that'll be a temporary addition just until I get my levels back right again. But I did add that flow in there. I have been gently raising my alkalinity to take care of it. And I have been adding a bit of extra uh, phyto, a bit of extra aquaforest uh, life source, just a few nice sort of organics to try and get some bacteria and things back in check. And I have to say it's mostly worked. It did come at the cost of a couple of corals. In fact, you'll see a couple of um, wiped out colonies in there. It seems like it affected the corals that were growing into each other. Anything that had a little bit of a, a coral warfare at that point in time seemed to be just super susceptible to the cyanide. And once the cyano took hold of it, there wasn't a lot I could do. It, I could do to save it. Thankfully, I didn't lose any of my uh, favourite colonies, so I can live with it. And also, thankfully, I'm not the sort of person that rushes to take out, particularly Acropora. I don't really rush to take out dead colonies because for me, that is kind of the reef way. Something dies, something else then spawns on it, grows out of it. Now, I'm in a closed ecosystem, so I don't get a lot of coral spawning, but it does give me the ability to pick up a couple of extra frags or colonies and put them on 
to the dead acro once all the cyano is cleared off it. So it gives me a nice sort of natural scape to put new corals on. And that's what I have done mostly with uh, pieces I picked up from Deer Park Aquarium, but I do have a few special shout outs to give. I picked up a number of pieces, some frags, some small colonies and a couple of big colonies from Richard Pittard, who I did do a video on his tank recently. He had to shut his tank down temporarily. They're doing a full house renovation and um, moving a full reef system and maintaining it in a temporary location and then moving a full reef system back was just going to be a bit too difficult so he took the opportunity to sell off some of his coral kept the fish just in a fish only system and then once the house renovations are finished he will set up fresh again and then go from the, uh, step one with all new corals which i can totally appreciate so i picked up some really cool pieces from him i've got some uh, really nice uh miliopora or spath got a few awesome pieces of red dragon which i've got to say has quickly become one of my favorite corals out there the coloration that gets and that really different uh really fine skeleton structure is just something that really sets off the tank really, really well. So a really huge shout out to uh, Richard for the corals I got from you. I do appreciate it. Now, speaking of uh, reefers from Melbourne who were shutting down their tank, I did get an awesome sun-kissed bounce from a long time channel viewer and a good friend of mine, Joe, who had to move overseas for work. So um, I was able to pick up a coral off him before he shut his tank down. And uh, the sun-kissed bounce, which I've currently got down there, it's probably getting a little bit too much flow it's getting blasted which keeps the bounces fairly deflated but um super super cool piece and the final shout out i want to give is to nick and ashton from nick's aquarium in queensland i've got this awesome montipora rock which i picked up a number of frags off there what you see is what you get website they have upgraded that lately so you can have a look at corals that are actually the corals for sale not just sample pictures of corals and um i added all these frags to a nice little art reef rock frag bit which has sort of got the holes already drilled in it so it was super easy for me to get these frags stick them all on that rock lower that rock down into place and i've got five different monties on there they're probably all a little bit close and they're probably all going to go into some sort of warfare at some point in time but it's kind of what i want from that piece i want to see what it does if it gets this melting pot of different styles of monties different colors of monties that'll be awesome if one takes over, well, so be it. But um, I did pick those up from Nick. And I know Nick and Ashton do watch this channel regularly, so I wanted to give them a quick shout out here for having some of the coolest corals and really nice aquacultured frags available on your website. Now that's probably the majority of the new corals in the tank, but there has been some really cool growth of the existing corals. The Hammer Garden did lose a head or two in that little cyano uh, outbreak there. Now, speaking of Nick from Nick's Aquarium in Queensland, he did point out that I have probably unwisely mixed some uh, branching hammers with some wall hammers and he said that's probably not going to be great it's most likely true but i gotta say i have not had the issues over the last couple of years it was only when the cyano came in maybe then when there was a wall and a branching hammer touching each other they were more susceptible i'm not going to change things up too much so um take this as a uh, official thing of me saying i appreciate your advice nick but i am going to ignore it <laughs> not saying it's wrong at all but i just don't want to mix up my uh, hammer garden right now we'll see if it continues to be a problem I will definitely uh, separate out those hammers, but at the moment, I absolutely love it. And is particularly at the moment, one of the, um, probably one of the most striking features of the tank. So Hammer Garden looks absolutely awesome. My red Monty cap over there is just in its phase now where it grows probably right before your eyes. If you sit there long enough and watch it, you'll see it grow a few more little uh, millimeters of growth there. And it's got a pretty cool little pattern on it. My Acropora throughout the system are all doing really, really well. In fact, some of them that have been sitting almost dormant for a while are now really starting to hit a little bit of a growth spurt, which did actually account to that uh, alkalinity drop that I mentioned before, which caused the cyano. But um, we're back on top of that now. And um, some of the pieces in here are looking absolutely awesome and just growing really, really fast. I do have to frequently just break up the blue digi, take some of it out because it does just sort of try to take over the tank, which I don't want. But um, all in all, things are doing really great. I've got this gorgeous blue wild acro down here that is just the furriest thing. Uh, maybe the polyp extension is so good because my um, angel hasn't discovered it yet, but um, I'll make sh be sure to give you some footage of that. My uh, Walt Disney is nice and yellow. I did make the mistake of putting green stag right behind it, which doesn't give it the kind of contrast it really deserves. I should have put a pink or a purple piece behind it to really showcase that yellow. My Space Invader Pectinia is just growing and growing and growing. I probably do need to find a more permanent spot for it. I kind of just got it in a little bit of shade down there because I noticed it does do much better in lower light, which is kind of hard to find in my tank, but maybe I'll put it in that archway at the back there where it's half shaded. That could be a good spot and still giving it a really nice uh, sort of prime position. Other than that, I mean, if you saw my top down tour from uh, last week, 
you'll, you'll know that my tank, it's growing really quite well. In fact, the coloration and the growth is just gorgeous. I'm really happy with how that's going. In fact, I often pinch myself the tank is only two years old because I know my previous tank was pretty well grown in, but it was seven years old. And I have to admit, it really didn't get going till maybe maybe the three year mark. Um, that was when the growth really started to hit the sort of strides that I'm getting here. So to know that I'm a year ahead of that schedule of this tank um, is, is impressive. And it's something that I'm super happy with. Is there any coral I probably wouldn't do again in this tank because um, that was meant to be the theme of this video and uh, probably not. I mean, there's a couple of pieces in there that aren't the craziest of colors, but I don't mind that. Like this big uh, tabling acro here, that's just coming out. It's, it's kind of like a brown color, but it, it's got a cool growth pattern. It is super aggressive. It kills anything it comes in contact with. So I will have to keep it trimmed down. But I wouldn't take it out. I wouldn't not add it in. Um, it's one of those things, Wild Colonies is sort of the game I like to play. I'm not massive on the um, frag name uh, things. I, I mean, I do have some who doesn't. I, I love the designer corals out there, but I do really, really enjoy my wild Aussie SBS colonies that you pick up super cheap, talking like $40, $50 Australian, um, putting them in the tank and just seeing what they do. Some of them just have the most insane colors and growth patterns. Some of them like that guy there, maybe not so much, but that's kind of the fun you take. Um, one thing I absolutely would do differently, and I kind of did touch on it over here with the Walt Disney, I would be a little more mindful of the colors of pieces I'm putting in and what they're near. I've got a lot of blue corals in this tank because, um, probably because of my color blindness, I'm drawn to blue. So whenever I see a really nice blue coral, it's like my credit card comes out. I've got a lot of blue in there that is sort of near each other, which doesn't give them the contrast they need. And then likewise over here, I've got a big green stag behind my Walt Disney Acro, which makes it look a bit more green. Um, I mean, you can differentiate, you can see the yellow polyps on it, but something to really contrast that, like I said before, a pink or a purple, maybe like a fireworks, would have been a wiser choice. And then over here, I've got a little bit too much pink going on. Um, we sort of go from the red Monty into a couple of uh, tabling pinks and then a cherry bomb and then a uh, strawberry shortcake. There's a bit too much of that going on, which um, kind of makes it just sort of blend into each other. So I don't know, it's a shame one of those wasn't the coral that died in the cyano outbreak in this tank, but yeah, you get that, things happen. One thing I do love and I haven't mentioned it yet is this uh, Wicked Monty, this big pink piece here. That's just such a cool addition to this tank. It's been in there for a few months now and it's really getting some nice growth. Still sort of on the encrusting side. I don't think it's branched up any further yet, but I had a pretty, like I said, a very blue dominated space there and um, not a lot of room to work with. So putting that piece in there, which is really vertical, just broke up the blue there perfectly. And it's a growth pattern, it's color, it's a polyps. Everything about that coral is absolutely perfect. And um, again, it was like a 50 or $60 wild piece that, um, I just haven't seen elsewhere, so I absolutely love it. It's probably one of my favorite corals in the tank right now. All right, I think we're at the stage now where I've covered everything above the tank, everything in the tank. I think it's probably time we go below the tank because my sump and the equipment I run down there is something that's been asked most about since I'm setting this tank up, particularly how the sump's operating and if there's anything I'd change there. So maybe give me a second, I'll uh, take the cabinets off the, uh, off the stand. We'll get in nice and close and have a good look at that sump. All right, it's probably a fantastic opportunity to uh, point out just before we get to the sump, how much I absolutely love the cabinetry on this tank, including the motorized hood, the uh, panels, the doors. You saw how easy it was to remove so I get full access into the uh, stand and sump here. And Hayden from Dream Kitchens did an absolutely ridiculous job on this. So massive shout out to Hayden. I gotta say it wasn't the cheapest setup, but that was never on the forecast. This was my dream reef tank and I didn't go to Hayden and say, hey, can you build me the cheapest cabinetry available? In fact, it was quite the opposite. I went to him and said, can you make me the best cabinetry available? And um, Manny hit the target so well. It's so easy to clean. It has the most luxurious fit and finish to it. The soft closed doors, the uh, feel of the, uh, the, the material used. It's super easy to clean. How nice and uh, open and non-restrictive that cabinet hood is there. When I open that up and I raise the light frame up, I get full access into the tank. It just hit every single one of the uh, briefs that I gave him. And in reality, it honestly did not cost that much. It was just one of the best additions to this tank. And then 
to couple that up to with what I called my dream reef tank stand. That's the piece that started this entire dream reef tank. That was the thing that I built everything around. I knew I wanted extruded aluminium stand and whilst it was very, very expensive in comparison to either a timber or even a steel stand, possibly could even have gone stainless steel for less money. The extruded aluminium has been something that I would not change in a heartbeat. It's been so nice. It was so easy to design, to build it exactly the way I wanted to, to bring it home by myself in my family car, to carry it into my lounge room and assemble it there and then be able to move it into place by myself was absolutely ridiculous compared to a either a timber or a steel or a stainless steel stand. And um, being able to add things onto it like I did with the fan and my light frame has just been ridiculous. And um, it has not shown any signs of uh, degradation. I know there was a bit of talk about uh, the titanium and the stainless and the aluminium doing some weird oxidization um, between them. But uh, I did take some of the advice on board and use some of the, I uh, can't remember what it's called, but there's a, a compound that's used in sailing where they often mix mix aluminium and stainless fasteners together and it's to stop them sort of corroding between each other and I gotta say it's worked an absolute treat. Even the uh, plain steel hinges that come with uh, the cabinetry, which I was expecting to have to replace say every 12 months because it is a salty and humid location. I was expecting them to get a lot more surface rust. I haven't put any sort of coating on them whatsoever. I did have intentions of putting some coconut um, oil on them, but I didn't and they've only just started to now, two years later get the tiniest amount of surface rust and um, I can just pick them up from my local hardware store and it's like a five minute job to swap all of the hinges out. So I could not be happier with the uh, stand and cabinetry. But apart from the stand and cabinetry, it's probably time to move on to the sump and the equipment in here and um, even some of the supplements and things I'm using because um, I know there's a lot of things in here so we should get stuck into covering it. Probably first and foremost is the big custom Hamali sump. Now, I've got to say that video had a huge number of views and it continues to go up and up. We're nearing 100,000 views on that video from when I first got this sump and um, two years later, I've got to say, there's very little, if anything, I'd change about it. I do get questions probably, I was gonna say daily, but probably more realistically weekly from people saying, I'm building a uh, custom setup. Should I splurge the money on a Hamali sump? Now, I'm not gonna lie to you guys, the Hamali sump is a beautiful piece of work, but it is pretty damn expensive. And um, I can understand why Eric and his team do incredible hand-crafted work on these things here in Australia. And the results absolutely speak for themselves. However, and I'm sure Eric would even agree himself, you do not need a custom acrylic Hamali sump to have an outstanding tank. What I do think you need though, is a well-designed sump. Now, if you can build that yourself in a glass, or you can have someone else build it in glass, you can do fine. You do not need acrylic in your sump to get the results that you're looking for. It does just make some things a little bit more possible. And some of the design features we went for in this sump still hold true to that, still hold true to that to this day. And um, there's not much about it I would change. I guess, one thing I will point out though, is that take your time designing a sump, particularly if you're a gear junkie like I am and you're gonna try and cram a gazillion things in there, take your time and like I did, go through every single design aspect and make sure it's perfect for you because um, I've gotta say, I've never had a sump this long that has continued to do exactly what I needed to do. Trends and uh, approaches and methodologies in this hobby continually change so, if you build something for the equipment you had in mind on day one or the method or process you had in mind on day one, chances are 12 months or 24 months into your journey, that's gonna change. Now, I'm not saying you should have a crystal ball and say, oh yes, the next fad in this hobby will be, um, I don't know, some sort of bio pallet that uses uh, uranium. You're not gonna know that, right? We don't know that until it happens, but you can accommodate by leaving enough space either in the sump or outside of the sump to accommodate what you need. Now. I did design this sump around three main, well, probably four main things. I wanted filter roller because it was something I'd never done before. I was always a filter sock guy, which ironically enough, back in the day when filter socks were the only option, I know a lot of people said that uh, they were bad for your tank, they took too much stuff out. 
I always liked them, so I always ran filter socks. The opportunity to get a big, heavy duty custom filter roller on this acrylic sump was too good to turn down. And I will say we did have a few teething issues with it, with the drive mechanism turning on the spline a little bit. We did have an issue with the motor as well, but um, Eric has been absolutely incredible to work through and we've refined this system now. And I gotta say, it's an absolutely incredible filter roller now. On a big system like this, it is so awesome not having to change the filter rolls every month. I change the filter roll on this like every six months, which is just ridiculously easy. A couple of thumb screws here, pull it off, bang, and there'll be a new one on. Bit of tape in place and you're off and running for another six months. So much easier than washing filter socks, which is super, super handy. The next component that I had to focus around was a good size skimmer. Now, what made things a little bit tricky there is I didn't want to overcompensate for the skimmer the section anyway, just in case I ended up going to a massive skimmer because it was gonna eat into the other room. So I did sort of pick the largest skimmer that I think I would ever run in this system, which was this cove here and built it around that. I do have a little bit of extra room in there to play with, but um, if I decide to go to an external pump skimmer or something down the track, I might be a little bit limited there, but that's working an absolute treat. And then we shift down here to what I tried to give as much space as possible in my refugium, and that has been working an absolute treat. I pull a decent amount of algae out of there every week, and that's probably because I feed a lot of food in this tank. I don't feed coral food so much, but I do like to feed my fish a lot. I put in probably about a dozen frozen cubes a day in this tank. Uh, I like to have my fish nice and fat. So my methodology to reef keeping is a lot of energy in and a lot of energy out. So my refugium has been going absolutely great guns. I've got the uh, Kessel A360X refugium light on there and it's been working an absolute charm. I did actually burn through one about I don't know, about 18 months into it. And it was just beyond warranty, but I did reach out to Kessel and they were fantastic. They didn't replace it for me, but they did give me a very good deal on a replacement, which I do appreciate. I know things particularly like lights down here, sitting right above your sump, getting ran for 14 hours a day on full intensity. I'm not gonna live forever, but um, they came to the party on a decent replacement. So thank you very much, Kessel and the Australian distributor, Arj. And then into the final section back here, which is where all of my uh, bacteria housing, my biological media lives. And um, that's worked really well as well. Eric did a fantastic job with the, um, the caddies to hold them in there. Makes it easy for me to just reach in there, give them a good shake and get all the detritus out. Or every six months or so, I actually grab a bucket of water and I lift each one of those caddies out, put them in there and give it a good shake, tip all the balls out, get all of the detritus out of that media because despite having filter rollers and refugiums and skimmers, you do still get detritus flowing its way through there and you don't want to turn those uh, bacteria houses into nitrate factories. Everything else on this sump was fairly... Um, Utilitarian, I guess we've got a, a pretty small return chamber, which is just big enough to fit my two Abyss A200 pumps in there. I have to tell you, I don't think I've opened that since installing the tank. The pumps are in there. Abyss are ridiculously reliable. I probably should take them out now and give them a service, but they are running just so super smoothly. You cannot tell they're on unless you look up and see the uh, water flowing out. So don't need to do anything with that. My RO reservoir, again, it's automated. I have built a little latching relay system in there, which has my RO unit outside turn on when it's empty and turn off when it's full. I do hear that coming on probably every two days now. I probably could put something on that. So it told me when it was on, but I don't really need to know. Filling RO is one of those jobs I don't think you really need to do in this hobby. You can automate it. So it's in there. Interestingly, I have not had a ATO pump on this tank for probably 12 or 14 months, I actually monitor the level myself and I adjust my Kelkwasser doser from there. I actually kind of work the opposite way. I have the Kelkwasser running at a set amount and I have some of these auto aqua sensors in here that if the water level gets too high, it just turns them off. So instead of when the water level gets low, turning an ATO pump on, I have the ATO pump running constantly and when the water level gets too high, it turns off, which Achieves the same thing, but it's just a different way of approaching it, I guess. Probably, in my opinion, is a little bit of a safer way to do it, but I still recommend whatever methodology you choose for automation that you uh, keep a close eye on things. And apart from that, that is the sump. There's not that much to it, but um, there's a lot happening in a fairly small space. As much as I would have loved to have uh, commandeered the room behind this fish tank and turned that into an entire sump room, my wife was not gonna be overly comfortable with me taking our laundry and making it a fish room. So I had to make it work under here and uh, the combined height of the stand, which is nice and high to get into, the beautifully designed Hamali sump, which had 
all of the details down to uh, lining up exactly with where the overflow pipes were for the, from the weir. So we had nice straight runs down to there. Things like this baffle here lining up with this upright in the stand, having access to all sides of the tank has turned out an absolute treat. So um, I absolutely do recommend the acrylic sumps from Himali. You can get them from BRS in America now for all of my viewers over there. And you can also pick them up in the UK now. I'm pretty sure it's Platinum Reef. I'd need to check that. Do carry them into the UK. So if you are looking for an absolutely ridiculous sump, be sure to source out. Have a good look at Himali Australia's incredible line of work. All right, now I did touch on some of the equipment in the sump. I barely touched on the Cove skimmer. Now I've got to say it's worked so well that I don't have to do that much to it. I've got the, uh, the skimmer cup plumbed into the drain, which also has my two auto testers drained to it as well, which gives a nice little, um, actually my three auto testers, got the Mastertronic, the ReefBot Lab and the KH Guardian all draining into it, which just keeps a nice little bit of acidic um, fluids going in there to keep that uh, skimmate breaking down so that it goes through the, uh, it, through the uh, plumbing into the drain, which works a treat. I've got a neck cleaner on it and I do also have a float switch in there should that drain get clogged and the skimmer cup fill up. I don't want it to overflow and cause me any sort of troubles. So so that skimmer just works on its own. I barely ever have to touch it. I've got the settings dialed in. I do have the uh, external air feed through a CO2 scrubber on there, going through a PacSun scrubber using Aquamarine Aquaristic CO2 media. And it just does its thing. I do notice when um, the Venturi clogs up a little bit, I notice mostly from my uh, Reef Factory pH monitor that um, something's not right there because when I check the tank in the morning, I see the pH is a bit low. First thing I do is check the sort of bubble consistency in the body and um, you can see that it's not working as efficiently as it should. I take that Venturi off, give it a poke with a skewer, get all the uh, sort of build up in there out, put it back on and uh, she works an absolute treat. That's literally the only sort of maintenance I do to it. Once a year, I like to take it out and uh, give that pump a good clean and give the body a good thorough scrubbing. But um, other than that, I just let it do its thing. Over in uh, my media chamber section, I do have a couple of uh, Shago titanium heaters ran by the Aqualogic controller from Fresh by Design. That's just been rock solid, working an absolute treat. I haven't had to do a single thing to it. We touched on the Abyss return pumps working an absolute treat in my RO chamber. That's really the only equipment running in my sump and um, that's the way I like it. It's working fantastically. I do highly recommend these auto aqua sensors though. If you just want to turn things on or off at set water levels or temperatures, they work an absolute treat. All right, moving on to the things under the tank in the cabinet here, but not within the sump. You can see I've got quite a bit going on there and that's because I am a reef equipment junkie. I do love it. The uh, new gadgets, the technical aspects, and just trying to find these little minute ways to uh, alter your reef experience is something that absolutely intrigues me in this hobby. So you can see I do have three different automated testers on this tank at the moment. The brand new Reef Bot Lab there, which um, I do have a discount code. If you use Parker's Reef on that discount code, you get yourself $100 US off their uh, pre-order price, which is a heck of a deal. I will have the full review of that coming up soon, but it is running an absolute treat just at the point now where I'm about to do a uh, maintenance a bit of a service on it so I can give you the full experience of what I think it's like but um, it's been running in tandem with my Mastertronic here which is the uh, permanent automated tester on this tank and uh, the results have been very very consistent between the two in fact one example that was really really cool um, in fact I've done it twice now one video I did was on uh, the Sarah stick on tabs in this tank. Now I fed a couple of the tablets into this tank in the middle of the day. So I did not feed frozen that night. And we touched on before that I do like to feed about a dozen cubes of frozen food. Each morning, both of these testers test phosphate for me and let me know. And they just about always say 0 0.04, 0 0.06 ppm on my phosphate. Now, both of them that day reported 0 0.02 ppm because I didn't feed frozen that night. It was just the tablet stick on foods there, which I thought was really cool. Just a little change like that. And the consistency between both of these testers reported a drop in phosphate, which was really, really awesome to see and uh, very, very responsive and reactive to what I was doing in the tank. Likewise, when I changed the GFO, they both started to report 0 0.06, 0 0.08 ppm. I thought it's getting up there a little bit. I'll change the GFO. Both of them reported 0 0.04, 0 0.02 the next day, which 
Again, it was nice to see the results reflect what I was doing in the tank. So that worked an absolute treat. They're testing a slew of parameters at the moment. It is one thing I do love about both of these style of auto testers is you can adjust them to test the things you want it to test. It's not like it tests one thing out of the box. It tests what you want to test. You put the brand of test kit that it's compatible with, of course, into it. You set it up and then schedule when you want it to test and the frequency. Both of them very, operate very, very similarly. In fact, they both do exactly the same job, slightly different footprint, slightly different methodology about it. But in reality, it's all about emulating or replicating you doing the test manually, just doing it by machine, which personally I love. I love watching the robots go to work and you can see it on both of the machines. When it does the test, it's pulling water samples out, flushing with RO, adding reagent one, cleaning the syringe, adding reagent two, watching the color change and then reporting what the result is. It's super, super cool to see. Now, apart from that, there's a few other bits of aquarium uh, equipment outside of those things there. You can see on the far right there, my uh, Reef Octopus Kalkwasser reactor. That's been an absolute beast. It's been my first ever journey into Kalkwasser and it's worked really, really well. I will say though that the motor is getting a little bit noisy. I do only have it turning on four times a day for five minutes at a time to stir. So I don't think it's overloading it, but um, I can actually hear outside of the cabinet when it turns on because it does get a pretty decent hum now. So I probably should open that up and have a look at it, see whether it's something I've fixed myself or if I have to reach out to Reef Octopus to get a replacement motor. Time will tell. I am feeding all of these continuous things with Kamoa pumps. I've tried a number of uh, continuous duty pumps out there and I've got to say the Kamoa, in my experience, have been the best. Versus are by far the best software out there for continuous duty pumps, but Changing the tubing on them every three months gets pretty tiresome, and if you don't, the results can be pretty catastrophic. I do find the tubing on the Kamoas lasts, realistically, a minimum 12 months, probably a lot more than that. Um, I haven't changed either of those, and they've been running near on two years, so I probably should change them, but um, they really are a set and forget pump, and you can get the ones with local control or app-only control, like the X1 Pro T or the X1 Pro T2. They both work so, so well, and um, they've been doing the job well. Um, I do have one of those on the Sea Torch calcium reactor, which has also been fantastic. It's a little bit smaller of a calcium reactor than um, I was planning to run. I was looking at using a huge geo on this system, but um, I ended up going the Sea Torch because I absolutely love the fit and finish of them. And I gotta say that thing's been absolutely bulletproof, works really, really well. Um, I do power it with a, a Waypro pH controller, which a lot of people will turn their nerves up a bit, but um, I've used them for over 10 years and um, they've worked very well for me. And I do have the uh, carbon doser CO2 regulator, which I guess the Waypro pH controller is here on the market and the carbon doser is up here, but uh, it's the equipment I've ran all this time with calcium reactors and it does work really well for me. now. The final thing I should probably touch on is uh, the supplements here in front of the um, in front of the the sump here. I have been running the Reef Moonshiner program for some time now, and I have to say I do thoroughly enjoy it. I wouldn't recommend it for everyone out there. I do recommend it for people that like to be really in tune with their uh, their trace elements in the tank and are quite happy to do little micro doses here and there. It's probably not the system for someone that wants to fully automate and put it on doses. Not to say you cannot do it. In fact, I saw a uh, user on the Reef Moonshiner pro uh, forum the other day who had all of their trace elements automated with uh, Red Sea dosing pumps, which which looked incredible, but to be fair, that's probably an exception to the rule. The majority of us are do manually doing these each day. So if that's not for you, don't think you have to do it. The Reef Moonshiners program is just another program out there. And another thing I tell people is you can actually follow the Reef Moonshiners program without the Reef Moonshiners supplement. The fantastic guys there, Andre does a brilliant job. He makes all of his uh, intellectual property freely available. You can use his calculator, you can follow the methodology, the handbook. It's all completely free online. He only charges if you want to use his brand of supplements, which I think is a fantastic business model. And um, it's probably one of the main reasons why I've continued using the program. I do get brilliant results from it. I get great growth, great coloration, but I just, I like the openness of his approach and he's fantastic, very easy to chat with. You can jump onto the uh, Facebook page there, ask any of the slew of users from around the world if you're having any particular problems or questions or if you're trying to chase an extra bit of color out of a particular coral, they really are a fantastic bunch. And you can see my range of supplements here. I've printed out on the bottles here what my dosage is each day. It just makes coming in here. When I do my checks each morning in the tank, real quick and easy, I have a look at uh, things like the salinity from Reef Factory. I have a look at the uh, pH from Reef Factory. Have a look at the uh, 
the, the latest reading on my master tronic, have a look at uh, the alkalinity reported on my KH Guardian. And I just do my daily dosings of each of those supplements there. You can see I have substituted a couple out with the locally available coral essential supplements. Although I should say that the Reef Moonshiners program is now available here in Australia. And um, if you do a search for that, you'll find a couple of retailers that do sell it here locally. One thing I should probably touch on before I wrap up underneath here is this incredible acrylic drip tray that uh, local reefer Jason, who happens to work in the acrylic industry, and my local fish shop combined and worked together on this. I gave the uh, blueprints to my uh, extruded aluminium stand and they came up with this drip tray, which fits it like an absolute glove, as Jim Carrey would say. And um, it's been absolutely awesome. Not that I've had any massive spills, but whenever something has gone wrong, if I'm setting up an automated tester or something and I uh, have a line slip out, instead of it going into the skimmer or if a check valve or something pops off, instead of flooding the house or, or just getting the wood floor or something like that all soggy and gross, having this acrylic drip tray, which has a solid good, I think it's a bit more than an inch of height in there. It can hold a fair amount of water before it actually ends up draining out into my um, storm water. Not that I've ever had to do that, but it is there and it just gives incredible peace of mind. And I have to say, it also keeps things really neat and tidy. The um, nice high gloss acrylic finish with the uh, Phillips Hue lighting, which um, I know was a little bit over the top, but uh, it does just make the inside of this cabinet super bright and really easy to work on. You combine that with the fact that uh, with the Phillips Hue, I do have some smarts in there that if I open up the cabinet doors in the middle of the night, just to check on something rather than a blinding me with 100% brightness, it does just turn on a 10% brightness which is perfect for those uh, little uh, midnight checks of the sump that us reefers tend to do but um during the day like it is now when you've got the lights on it just lights up you can see everything that's happening and you don't have to get torches out makes working under here super super easy so um big shout out to phillips hue for the lighting and of course jason and deer park aquarium for designing that incredible drip tray all right, guys, I think that's probably everything on this deep dive. If you've made it this far into this video, thank you so much. I really do really, really humbly appreciate all of you out there from all around the world who have followed the journey of this dream roof tank. I've put, I mean, you guys have seen the video of how much money it cost me. I've put a considerable amount of money into it, which um, now that I find myself out of a job, <laughs> it seems like even more money, but um, that will only be temporarily. Considerable amount of money, a huge amount of time, massive amount of effort. I've had a huge amount of help from some incredible people in this industry. And um, I would be lying if I also said that I hadn't put uh, blood, sweat and tears into it because um, uh, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes things don't go right in this hobby. And um, we touched on losing one of my dream fish before. It still hurts me a little bit, but um, we'll, we'll get over it and move forward. There's been no shortage of blood on busted knuckles working on things. Um, one thing I probably didn't touch on is uh, the, the box outside with my chiller and my UV in there. I absolutely love having all of the heat and noise and clutter of that stuff outside but I probably could have designed the UV a little bit better so I could change the tube because changing the tube on that's an absolute nightmare and that does result in uh, busted knuckles. No shortage of sweat and uh, plenty of uh, swearing and maybe some bleeding knuckles as well, but you can't get everything perfect and the fact that it is outside and out of the way and um, silent works absolutely fantastic and that does outweigh the cons, I guess, but um, I'm getting sidetracked here. I, I just humbly appreciate everyone who has followed the journey. And um, I will say that uh, despite doing the Dream Reef Tank updates is one of my favorite things on this channel, I will probably dial back the frequency on them now. Now that the tank is at the two year mark, it's probably something I'll do every six months from here on out. So um, you will see a little bit more, uh, probably by then a little bit more updates for each one of those or a little bit more info in each of those updates rather than doing them monthly because um, the tank is kind of in a pretty much an autopilot mode mode now. I mean, I do still tinker with it every day, but it's really now just about sitting back and enjoying um, the fruits of my labor and um, the uh, pain of my credit card, I guess. So the tank's in a great spot. Um, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. And as you saw throughout the entire length of this video, there's very little I would change. I do just want to give a, a quick opportunity to give a massive shout out to each and every one of my channel members. Your names will be on screen now as we roll through the different tiers. You guys have uh, actually put your money into this channel, which is um, just next level. I really do appreciate it. I know it's not, um, you know, we're not talking sheep stations there, but um, a couple of bucks from each of you each month really does make a difference and uh, makes it possible for me to get out and about, do, uh, 
get new products to try on this tank to get to, to pay some of the travel expenses to get out to new stores and get out to other people's tanks to do videos on them and um, it does also just give me a really nice incentive and motivation to just keep putting 110% effort into this channel so thank you so much to all of the channel uh, members and of course all of the subscribers who have followed the journey throughout the um, I guess some of the trials and tribulations of me deciding that I was going to replace my tank that to be fair looked incredible pulled it down, came up with a pretty crazy scheme to spend a lot of money and a lot of effort to make a tank that um, wasn't that much bigger and in exactly the same location in my previous tank. But um, you've all followed along the journey and I do humbly appreciate you all for uh, taking the time out of your day to watch these videos. I guess I should probably wrap it up there. Like always, guys, if you do have any questions, comments, um, feedback, anything at all, please do pop it in the comment section down below. I do personally reply to every single comment there. So it is by far and the best way to get hold of me because um, I promise I will reply to your comment there. If um, you did enjoy the video, don't be shy. Give it a thumbs up. That helps the YouTube algorithm and it makes sure that this video will get recommended to other like-minded reefers out there, which um, definitely helps the channel out a lot. And likewise, if you have not subscribed yet, we've got over 24, maybe 25,000 subscribers now, which is absolutely mind blowing. But why stop there? Let's go for 30, 50, 100. If you haven't subscribed, please do. It takes two seconds of your time and it doesn't cost anything at all. Unless, of course, you want to become a channel member, you can have a look at the options in the join button down there. But um, that's absolutely not compulsory. If you want to become one of the members, I won't say no, though. But um, it's really just uh, an opportunity to um, get a bit more involved in this channel and uh, to help direct wreck some of the uh, pathways we'll take in this channel in the future. I think that's everything, guys. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. Till next time, stay safe, keep reefing. Cheers. Bye.